Hi, my name's Ed Nolan and I'm an A-level psychology teacher. And in today's lesson, we're going to look at how variables are used in psychological research. Now, when we're looking at this term variable, let's look at a definition of psychology, which is that it's a science of mind and behaviour. What does that mean? It means that we're interested in what changes the way we think, feel and act. That word change, another word for change is to vary. So all a variable is, is something that changes. And we in psychology will manipulate and measure things that change to see how they influence each other. So most psychological researchers are looking at a difference. If you have two different things, that is a variable, they vary. So here we have an apple and an orange. Let's say we're interested in which is sweeter, an apple or an orange. The thing that varies are two fruits, but also measuring how sweet something is. So we will then eat an apple, eat an orange and test the sweetness. Now in psychology and in other science, the two groups or the one thing that we're varying, those two groups is called an independent variable. And what we're doing is we're having a look if that, those two groups changing that influences something else called the dependent variable. Now, not all psychological research is like that. Some psychological research actually looks at not how different groups are, but how similar things are. And that's called a correlational study. So in a correlational study, instead of having two separate groups, having orange and apple, we have one group. But what we do is instead of measuring one thing's sweetness, we measure two things. So we're seeing how one group, how the relationship between the two things measured in one group are. I'll explain a little bit more um, in a minute. OK, so before we go any further, one of the challenges that psychologists face is that they've got these variables. They need to what's called operationalize them. That means they need to define them in a specific way, put them in a specific way so they can either manipulate them, i.e. create two different groups for our independent variable or more groups. And we've got to be able to measure them to make them specific enough so you can counter measure them. Let's say, for instance, I'm interested in the idea that fish eating fish will influence how intelligent you are. Great. Well, what I need to do is operationalize my independent variable, which is eating fish, in a way that I can manipulate and measure it. So how could I do that? I think, well, actually, what I will look at is this idea that people who eat fish and chips, and I will compare those to those who just eat chips. You got the idea? Fish in one group, not fish in the other. OK, so what I've done is I've operationalized my independent variable. Instead of saying, well, I just need fish, I've said, right, let's make this specific. Eating fish and chips or just eating chips. That creates my two groups. But I've also got to think about, well, how do I measure intelligence? Well, one way of doing that is through an IQ test. And what this is, is just a test of problem solving things that don't require any and prior knowledge, and this creates a score, an IQ score. There's an example of one of the questions below. Um, by the way, the answer is A. Right, so that's operationalization. Let's go back to our studies again then. So in most studies, what we do is we have an independent variable. We will operationalize our independent variable to make it two or more conditions. Now, in my study, that was eating fish and chips or just chips. That could be anything. Um, that could be males and females. It could be young and old. Whichever way we look at it, what we're interested in in our study. Then we go and measure something. We, we then see that we see how, what, whether our independent variable has had an effect on something by measuring it. And that's called our dependent variable. Great. That's what we want to do in psychological research. However, what we have a problem with is something called extraneous variables, because no matter how good your study is, you will always have other things that will influence your dependent variable. So, for instance, in my study, what else might influence your IQ or my participants IQ other than whether they eat fish or not? Well, that might be their age. That might be uh, their schooling. 
that might be their gender even or controversial that so an extraneous variable is any variable or anything that may have an effect on your dependent variable however if there is an extraneous variable that does have an effect on only one of your conditions we call that a confounding variable so for instance let's say my fish eaters did their iq test in the morning and my non-fish eaters did their iq test in the afternoon maybe that actually the time of day influences how well you do iq tests if that's the case and people who do their iq tests in the afternoon do less well the time of day has had an impact on one of my conditions my non-fish eating groups so what that says is an extraneous variable has changed someone's iq test score um other than whether they ate fish or not if you have a confounding variable that is an issue of validity you have a problem with validity in your study meaning you are not measuring exactly what you claim to measure let's have a look at that with a correlational study so in a correlational study we measure two things uh, for one group to see if it's related so for instance in my study instead of taking people who eat fish and chips and those who just eat chips what i just say is well i'll interview my participants and i will identify how much fish they generally eat in a week and that's my one measurement, my one covariable, and I will measure their IQ. That is my other covariable. Notice they're the same people, but I'm measuring two very different things. And generally, we're looking for a positive correlation. So my idea is the more fish you eat, the more the better your IQ. They don't always have to be a positive correlation. Sometimes they're negative correlations. We're looking for that as well. Now, if there is a variable that influences either of my covariables that it, I'm not taking into consideration. So for instance, um, gender, you know, whether you're male or female might influence your natural IQ or how much fish you eat. Maybe it's a time of year, maybe we eat more fish in the summer and um, our IQ is better in the summer. There might be something that influences either of them. That is an extraneous variable. If there is something that influences just one of them, that would be seen as a confounding variable. So there are four different types of extraneous variables. By the way, if you're getting a bit confused over whether they're confounding or extraneous, just call them an extraneous variable. Because a confounding variable is just an extraneous variable that has one effect. So if you refer to them as an extraneous variable, if you're not sure. Well, there are four main types of extraneous variables. And as a psychologist, what you will need to be able to do is to identify extraneous variables and say how to overcome them. So one of those extraneous variables is the situation the study is done in. That could be if it's noisy outside or there could be lots of people around and they influence what the participants do. It could be the um, time of day that it's done in or what's just happened before they came into the study. Anything to influence the situation, um, anything in the situation that might influence your dependent variable that might change your dependent variable. So, for instance, in my fish and chip uh, study, it could be whether they were on holiday or not, because you tend to eat more fish and chips. When you're on holiday well at least i do okay so how do we control that well we standardize the procedures what you do is you make the situations the same you control the noise you control the amount of people you do it at the same time you make sure they're all on holiday or none are on holiday and by standardizing that should control those extraneous variables the next one is called participant variables. This is really quite an important one, particularly for experiments. This is something to do with the characteristics of each of your individual participants that might influence their performance on the dependent study, dependent variable. And um, so, for instance, just someone's general IQ. Now, in my study, that's not going to be uh, that. Well, that might be an impact that they're, they're biologically more intelligent or not. But in, for instance, a memory study, someone's general IQ. Um, it could be whether they're male or female might have an effect. It could be to do with their characteristics. See, there's a happy one, a sad one, an angry one. I'm not sure what the other finger is. But someone's natural character, someone's personality might play a part. 
or maybe their age. But instead of being to do with the situation, this is to do with the participants yourself. Something about your participants might influence your dependent variable that you're not aware of. So how do we deal with that? Well, we use what's called a repeated measures design. You use the same participants in each of your conditions. So in my study, to influence someone's natural IQ or their personality having an impact, what I would do was I would get my participants not to eat fish for a period of time, do an IQ test, then give them fish, and then do another IQ test. I know I'm using the same people with the same natural abilities, same characteristics. So those things are not going to influence one or the other conditions. Another way of dealing with that, though, is just matching them using a match pairs design. You're matching up people so they are very similar. So you can try to control participant variables. Now, another third um, extraneous variable is researcher effects. This is something about the research. So we've looked at the situation that people are in, the participants nature of themselves. Now, the other person that might have an impact on our study is the researcher. Now, this could be to do with a researcher's status. For instance, if I was to interview my students about underage drinking, I might not get full um, kind of accurate, um, honest answers. Why? Because of my status as a teacher. That might have an impact on my dependent variable, on my, what I'm measuring. It could be that it, as a researcher, they might know the aim of the study. So, for instance, my IQ test study. If I know the aim, I might be more encouraging or I might use nonverbal communication to kind of help the students who eat fish to do better because that then supports my hypotheses. Another one might be the relationship. If you are friendly with that, the participants or not, they may or may not be more honest with you. So the research themselves might influence the study. Well, how do we get over that? One way we get over it is by doing a double blind study meaning that you don't tell the person collecting the data, the researcher, what the aim of the study is, or even which participants are in the control and experimental group, so they can't influence the study. Another way of doing it is by just standardising what the researchers do. Give them a standardised brief, make sure everything is done in uniform. So that, set in, that saves any influence of the researcher on one group over another. So. The last one is something called order effects. That's when we do something called repeated measures design, because you've got the same participants in the two conditions, like my one where they don't eat fish, do an IQ test, and then eat fish and then do the IQ test. The problem with that is, is the order in which they do it might influence their performance. So, for instance, they might just get bored of doing IQ tests. So towards the end, they'll do whatever. I'll just write whatever down. It's not really a true measurement of their intelligence. Or they might get better because it's the second time they've done an IQ test. They might just get better at doing them. And that's what I'm measuring. So, for instance, I know I can increase my or did increase my IQ score on IQ test by 15 points by just doing them um, a few times. So how do we deal with that? Well, what we can do is something called counterbalancing, an idea that we get um, two conditions, condition A and B, fish and non-fish, if the same participants are being used in repeated measures design, we get half of them to eat fish and then do their IQ test, and then the other half to eat um, non-fish and then do their IQ test and then switch them around. Notice that, so half do condition A first and half do condition B first, then half do condition B first, and half do condition A first. And what that should do is that should counterbalance the order in which they're doing the conditions, because both conditions have half the participants doing their, um, well, measuring the dependent for them on the second time. Okay. Now, of course, what you get is a bit of APA. Yeah. So that's great. Right. What have we learned today? I'll just press the button uh, a bit too much. One thing that we have learned today is that psychologists um, manipulate um, and measure um, variables. The, the variable they manipulate is called the independent variable. The one they measure is record, called the dependent variable. But these variables need to be operationalized. They need to be made specific in a way to be changed or measured. 
that correlations just measure a relationship between two variables tending to be from the same group. And that uh, extraneous variables are something that might have an effect on um, the co-variables or the dependent variables. But there are four types of extraneous variables. Remember those, the situation, the participant, the researcher, and the order. And that these extraneous and com com confounding variables need to be controlled in order um, to make our studies valid. Well done. Finish the video. Um, thank you very much and uh, good luck on all your psychology.